I'm Dean Williams. I'm a professor in biology at TCU. Uh, a big part of my research is conservation genetics, and so we use genetics uh, to basically answer questions uh, that help conserve uh, both animals and plants. So at TCU, these things are called horn frogs, uh, but throughout most of the rest of Texas, uh, these things are known as horny toads, and the reason is because they have this kind of flat, uh, tank-like shaped body. Uh, it's very different from a lot of other lizards that are long and slender, long tails, and they can run fast. Horn lizards are very slow compared to a lot of other lizards, uh, and that's because of this body shape. As a result of this slowness and because they have to be outside in the open eating ants all the time, they mainly rely on crypsis. And so you can see they have this complex number of colors as well as ridges and stuff on the body that basically break up uh, their shape uh, while they're on the ground. It makes them very difficult to see. Uh, and then you can see the horns. That would be kind of a secondary adaptation to predation and the ability to uh, squirt blood from their eyes. But really their first line of defense is not being seen. They spend a lot of time just sitting uh, in one place. Uh, for instance, when they're foraging on ants, they'll just sit next to the ant trail and they'll lick up ants as they go by and they'll stay there for a long time before moving on. People began to notice this species disappearing in parts of Texas uh, in the 1960s, uh, probably in large part because of loss of habitat in those areas. Uh, another thing that probably negatively impacted them was the introduction um, of invasive red fire ants. It's known that these ants uh, can prey uh, on ground nesting animals, uh, the eggs and the young of ground nesting animals. They also uh, seem to be able to outcompete harvester ants, uh, which is the main food source uh, for horn lizards in Texas. Uh, and so, you know, all of those things together, I mean, it probably varies depending on where you're at in Texas and also the time period. Uh, but, you know, they declined for a variety of reasons. The overcollecting uh, that occurred in, in, you know, the 40s and 50s for the pet trade and the curio trade probably also uh, contributed uh, to their declines as well. Possibly the use of pesticides. This project started way back in 2009. A member of uh, TPW uh, came and talked to me and asked if I'd be interested in conducting a genetic study of Texas horn lizards across Texas. Uh, at that time, Texas Parks and Wildlife was beginning to think about reintroducing this species into areas where they had disappeared. And what we found was that this species is broken up into uh, several major genetic units. So there's a western uh, group, and that occurs way out by El Paso, the Big Bend area, and goes into Arizona and New Mexico. And then there's an eastern group, and that can be split into two subgroups. One is a northern group, and the other is a southern group. The northern group occurs uh, north of the Balcones Escarpment area, and the southern group is south of that. And so that really helped kind of set up uh, the strategy as to where these things would be reintroduced. Uh, the Fort Worth Zoo and the Dallas Zoos are going to breed northern uh, group lizards and those are going to be reintroduced into the northern area and the San Antonio Zoo is going to breed southern group lizards and those will only be reintroduced into southern areas. Uh, the western group uh, currently is not a problem in Texas and so there's no reintroductions. I'm not originally from Texas so you know I've, I've lived a lot of other places and horn lizards you know I always knew about them as a kid but I'd never seen one in the wild and so you know, when I heard about this opportunity, I thought, okay, here's my chance uh, to get involved uh, in working with this species and, and, and learning about them. And so it was a pretty easy sell.